Okay, lecture six, Luchenberg. Oops, get far. Sorry. All right, lecture six of Luchenberg's FDR New Deal, chapter eight. Um, and we're going to talk about <coughs> the uh, 1936 uh, election. So, again, put us into uh, placement here. Uh, 32. Uh, FDR is elected uh, president, defeating Hoover. Um, the first 100 days are in uh, right after his inaugural speech. Um, we have the midterm election, 1934. Uh, and then in the summer of 1935, we have the second 100 days. So now we're in the run-up to the 1936 election, which Franklin Delano Roosevelt is running for re-election. Uh, and so... Uh, Franklin Delano Roosevelt creates a political juggernaut, uh, a coalition that uh, supports Franklin Delano Roosevelt uh, and to the tune uh, of an enormous victory, as we shall see. Uh, and so um, talk a little bit about what are elements of that and how it came together. Um, in 1936, um, or prior to the 1936 election, Franklin Delano Roosevelt's biggest um, threat was probably not the Republican Party, but was probably Huey Long. Uh, Franklin Delano Roosevelt wasn't too fearful that Huey would um, beat him out for the Democratic nomination because uh, Franklin Delano Roosevelt had all the support of the political machinery of the Democratic Party, but he was afraid that Huey might break away and run as an independent. And then running as an independent, he would draw uh, enough votes away from Franklin Delano Roosevelt to throw the election to the Republican Party. So Huey was his biggest concern. And then Huey as a political concern was removed because Huey Long is assassinated. Now I know how conspiracy minded you all are. Uh, so I want to uh, assuage you of these conspiracy minded ideas. Huey Long was assassinated because he's Huey Long. Now what does that mean? That means that the way he amassed political power was a system of destruction of his opponents. Uh, Huey would identify somebody as um, somebody who's corrupt and ripping off the people. Uh, he would destroy their reputation and in that fashion demonstrate he's supporting um, the people and also removing a threat. So his uh, political career is marked by the destruction of others politically. Uh, sometimes Huey was telling the truth. These were people who were uh, rigging the system for their benefit. They were corrupt or whatever, um, but sometimes uh, they worked. And in one of these cases, uh, there was an, uh, a, a somewhat obscure backwater uh, parish judge. And Huey Long uh, said he was on the take, was working with other folks uh, corruptly, uh, and ruined this man politically. Uh, this man had a daughter. And this man's daughter married, and she married an Austrian immigrant, an immigrant uh, who left Austria because he saw in this emerging political movement of Austria related to Germany, uh, a fascist state that was beginning to uh, uh, coalesce. Uh, and so he fled Austria because of his fears of fascism and a dictatorship. He, in Huey Long, he saw the same tendencies, an attempt to create a dictatorship centered around a fascist leader. Uh, and so uh, this individual decided to take upon himself to exact um, an interruption in Huey's career. Uh, he did so by uh, coming up to Huey Long as he left the Louisiana State House and shooting him in the stomach. Uh, as soon as he shot Huey, Huey's bodyguards immediately uh, shot and killed the assassin. Uh, reportedly, Huey said as he fell to the ground, I wonder why that fellow shot me because he didn't know that this Austrian immigrant from anywhere, and he probably would have remembered the judge he ruined, but not his son-in-law to be sure. So uh, Huey was shot in the gut, uh, and then either through uh, incompetence or uh, some assert that the uh, doctor who examined him was drunk, I don't know. Um, the, uh, the physician uh, missed the fact that the bullet uh, nicked Huey's uh, internal organ, organs, his liver, I believe. Uh, and so uh, Huey bled to death internally. Uh, 
um, because the fact that uh, he, this organ had been nicked and was bleeding out uh, was not caught by the physician. So Huey died. He died because um, this man assassinated him and he was assassinated because, partly because of Huey's uh, politics of destruction. Uh, so um, uh, a terrible event for Huey Long, uh, but for Franklin Delano Roosevelt's political fortunes, um, the removal of Huey as a political threat was an immense uh, bonus. And uh, so uh, Franklin Delano Roosevelt created a, a, a coalition of supporters and I want to uh, talk a little bit uh, in some detail because it creates uh, an enormously powerful uh, political element. And it's still uh, many of the elements that uh, Franklin Delano Roosevelt wedded together in this 1936 election are still the elements uh, of the Democratic Party into the present day. So first thing, Northern liberals. Um, the Northern liberals find in the home of the Democratic Party their place. Uh, and many of these Northern liberals are urban immigrants. And so this needs a little bit of uh, further discussion. Uh, these urban immigrants came to find in the Democratic Party uh, a political home because of what Franklin Delano Roosevelt did. What Franklin Delano Roosevelt did is that he extended to these immigrants, uh, uh, Irish Catholics, uh, Italians, um, uh, Jews, uh, folks who had been, they, uh, the political parties counted on their votes, but they really didn't receive any authority within the, the infrastructure of either the Democratic or Republican Party. They were seen as votes, not as people who could run uh, the party. Under Franklin Delano Roosevelt, the Democratic Party offered out to these people uh, and incorporated them into the system and gave them real ruling power in how the Democratic Party operated. And so um, uh, Franklin Delano Roosevelt would uh, appoint these people as in high positions as chiefs of staff or uh, you know, uh, deputy directors of certain things. So in this party, the fact that they were Irish or Italian or Jews or whatever um, was not something that prevented them from being part of the political machinery. Uh, so this Northern Liberal Party came to find in the Democratic Party uh, their home. Um, and I always use the example, uh, which was true until the last few years, uh, but it's not, by, um, uh, it's not by accident that the two um, senators from the fine state of Massachusetts went by the name of Kerry and Kennedy, because uh, the Irish political machine, part of this urban immigrant population, uh, were wedded to the Democratic Party and ran Massachusetts politics for over a century. So that political power is manifested in senators, in representatives, and people who run uh, the machinery of, uh, the, of Democratic politics in uh, the state of Massachusetts. Okay? Uh, second part of this coalition, the African-American community. And this too needs some uh, uh, understanding. So the African-American community were overwhelmingly, overwhelmingly Republicans, uh, going back to the Republicans of the party of Abraham Lincoln, the party that uh, won the Civil War and brought emancipation to the South. Uh, so that, that loyalty to the Republicans was uh, still uh, paramount. Um, and it seems strange to consider, um, but uh, in 1932, 75% uh, of the African-American community, or somewhere in the neighborhood of 75% of the African-American community, uh, voted for Herbert Hoover uh, in the 1932 election. It's hard to imagine why they would be voting for Herbert Hoover, who had done next to nothing uh, for the African-American community, but um, they were Republicans, and they were loyal Republicans, and they voted. Uh, this 1936 election leads to an almost complete flip, right? And it, it comes to an almost complete flip despite the fact that the, the uh, Roosevelt administration did very little to reach out to the African-American community. Uh, Roosevelt was even, uh, even resistant supporting uh, anti-lynching legislation that was being proposed in Congress. Um, lynching was continuing uh, in the American South, much as we saw in the days before the anti-Klan laws, it was largely being unpunished. So there was an effort to uh, federalize these crimes uh, as anti-lynching laws, uh, and they were kicking around in Congress, but Franklin Delano Roosevelt did not support them. 
He did not support them because he feared that if he supported anti-lynching legislation, he would lose the votes of uh, white Southern Democrats. And the white Southern Democrats were enormously powerful in the United States Congress. Uh, much the same reasoning that uh, his uh, second cousin, uh, Teddy Roosevelt, um, uh, did not support African-American uh, positive legislation in the Congress because of fears of the political backlash from uh, the Democratic Party of the South. So even though the fact that there was a lot of uh, pressure on Franklin Delano Roosevelt to support anti-lynching legislation, it's hard to imagine uh, on the face of it that anti-lynching legislation is controversial, he was unwilling to do so because of the political cost. He feared, uh, probably accurately, um, that this would uh, uh, scuttle much of his domestic legislation that he had hoped to pass through Congress. So even without that support, he still won the political loyalty of the uh, African-American population. What, what changed? Um, and what changed is uh, in one way so minor that really gives us uh, insight into how poorly the African-American community was treated uh, and how, um, how little attention was paid to them politically. So what did he do? The New Deal legislation addressed the economic disaster in a variety of different formats of the Great Depression. In the American South, the former Confederacy, the place where still at this time the majority of the African American community lived, there was, a, prior to the New Deal legislation, there was sort of an unofficial rule. The unofficial rule ran like this. Um, if there was aid to be distributed, 20% um, of it went to the African American community and then 80% was reserved for the white community, wherever the disaster happened. Whoever was most affected, there was this sort of de facto splitting up of aid and support in the wake of disasters. So 80% went to the white community, um, whether or not they needed 80% of the aid, right? So there was this unofficial uh, splitting up of uh, disaster relief uh, that extended throughout the American South, right, and the border states. What the New Deal did was that it changed this delivery of aid into whoever is the worst off gets it first. It adopted, not completely, uh, not across every program, but to a much greater extent, it adopted a, pro a process of colorblind distribution of aid. To our eyes today, it makes the most sense. The people who are the worst off should get the aid first, right? That seems to be common sense and um, it seems to be uncontroversial. But the fact that the New Deal legislation allocated many of the aid uh, efforts along those lines was revolutionary. Uh, and it didn't limit the black population just to 20%. If they needed, if the black community needed more than 50% of the aid, then they got 50% of the aid. So that sort of minor change, I would, I would say in our eyes today, was really quite dramatic at the time. And this purchased the loyalty of the African-American community. So in the 1932 election, somewhere around 75% of the black community voted for Herbert Hoover. In 1936, that number flipped to nearly two thirds of the black community voted for uh, Franklin Delano Roosevelt. Unions. Unions became a major component of the Democratic Party. They became Franklin Delano Roosevelt's singus biggle, singus biggest single biggest contributor uh, in the 1936 election. Before, they had not been even on the radar of somebody uh, delivering aid. But uh, the support of uh, FDR for labor, first in the form of subclause 7A, uh, and then the political support he put through in muscling the Wagner Labor Act through, uh, purchased the political loyalty of these uh, rapidly emerging industrial organizations. And they became the foot soldiers, um, the, the people who go around and knock on doors, the people who pass out campaign literature, uh, the people who pick up other people and deliver them to the polls so they vote. Uh, they became the foot soldiers of the Democratic Party, um, and they uh, became a very active component. And they are still uh, a large component of the Democratic Party today. The union uh, even though unions are shrinking as a percentage of the working population, uh, they still form a very uh, um, large component of the Democratic foot soldiers in the get out the vote efforts or distribution efforts of those sorts. Um, 
And then when we think about it, the unions, right? So unions, the working men, uh, those concerns, that was the concern of the Socialist Party. Uh, this is the Democratic Party who's promoting these ideas of unionism and protecting the rights of workers. It's this support that destroyed the Socialist Party in the United States. Uh, many socialists said, we've been voting for the socialists and socialist uh, candidates for years and never won any elections, not even close. Um, and they found in a Democratic Party a home for this uh, idea of the working man's union, right? Uh, so uh, that effort destroyed uh, the Socialist Party and brought many of them into the, uh, under the umbrella of the Democratic Party. The Democratic Party also uh, brought in a number of former progressives uh, because they found in the Democratic Party and Franklin Delano Roosevelt's uh, efforts in the Democratic Party uh, successful efforts to achieve what they wanted. So last lecture we talked about um, the uh, breaking up um, the union or the trust of uh, companies that ran um, uh, all the uh, power and electricity and those utilities, right? So breaking up the holding companies, breaking up the trusts that run utilities, well, that's very much a progressive goal, right? And so progressives, uh, many of them Republicans, right? The Progressive Party formed as a, uh, under Teddy Roosevelt or during Teddy Roosevelt's time and incorporated many uh, Republicans, they found that their ideas, their progressive goals were being achieved by the Democratic Party. Uh, and so they moved uh, out of the Republican Party into the Democratic Party. So the 1932 election, Franklin Delano Roosevelt has enormous um, support in this form of this coalition. And he achieves an overwhelming electoral victory. Uh, Franklin Delano Roosevelt won big, and he won um, uh, by a very large uh, majority between the two candidates. Uh, he uh, polled 27.4 million votes for president. The Republican uh, opponent, Alf Landon, poor Alf Landon, I should say, uh, former governor of Kansas, um, running as a member of the Republican Party, running on uh, agreeing with many of the same ideas that Franklin Delano Roosevelt had, although he was a Republican, he gets trounced. He lost, uh, he only gathered 16.6 .6 million votes. Uh, this was the largest in terms of votes uh, difference between the two uh, in recorded American history until that time. Uh, he's later surpassed, FDR is later surpassed by LBJ, but that's another story. Uh, so uh, Franklin Delano Roosevelt wins big in this reelection effort. And Franklin Delano Roosevelt has what's known as long coattails, because not only does he win big, he sweeps in a lot of Democrats into office as well. Uh, so um, this, is, this is a Democratic victory at virtually every level of government, from the presidency, Franklin Delano Roosevelt wins big, uh, through uh, the House and Senate efforts, and all the way down to governors and state level uh, efforts as well. It's an enormous Democratic uh, victory. There's so many Democrats who win in the United States Congress that they can't even sit together. There's sort of an informal seating arrangement. Democrats sit on one side, Republicans sit on the other. You can see it when we see the State of the Union address today. One half of the, uh, uh, the audience gets up and is clapping wildly, and the other half are sitting on their hands, right, depending on um, who the president is and what they're saying. So there's, there's this sort of uh, seating arrangement where they sit on opposite sides. Well, now there's so many Democrats, they can't even sit on the same side of the room. And they, be, they have to be seated on the side of the Republicans as well. So this number, uh, there are 333 Democrats in the House of Representatives and only 80 Republicans. In the United States Senate, it's even worse. There are 76 Democrats and only 15 Republicans. Um, the House, as we know, is up for election every two years. So people have had the opportunity to vote um, uh, for the representatives. 1936 would have been the last ones for uh, senators elected uh, at the start of the uh, Great Depression in 1930. Um, some of them uh, haven't faced re-election since then. Now they face the voters and the voters vote overwhelmingly for Democrats. This uh, gives an unparalleled amount of political power in the hands of Franklin Delano Roosevelt. Uh, I always like to use the example that um, the entire Republican caucus in the United States Senate could go out to lunch and be seated without reservations. 
right? So for those of you who work in the restaurant business, you know that if 15 people come in for lunch, you know, there's a little grumbling, why don't you call ahead of time, blah, blah, blah. But you can push a couple tables together and suddenly you have, a, you can seat the whole party of 15. The entire United States Senate um, membership uh, in the Republican Party could be seated at lunch without a reservation. This is enormous political power that Franklin Delano Roosevelt has. Um, unmatched in terms of this. He is at his political peak as a result of this uh, uh, re-election in 1936. Um, next time we will talk about uh, shifting gears, talking about foreign affairs, and then when we come back talking about domestic affairs, we'll be talking about what Franklin Delano Roosevelt does with this political